By the spring of 1942 the situation on the Eastern Front was extremely difficult. Soviet tank units had lost most of their equipment in defensive battles and could not be replenished with new vehicles. Plants that were evacuated to the east were only just beginning mass production of military vehicles. And the new T-34 tanks, the best ones at that time, straight from the factory were going to the most dangerous sections of the front. A lot of tanks were needed for defense of Moscow. In the forests outside Leningrad the tank crews either fought as infantrymen or were left without any vehicles. Then the tankers of the 107th Battalion decided to get their own tanks. Looking for broken German tanks in the woods and swamps. At least repair the engines, take the tanks out of the minefields, restore them completely, create a separate company from the captured tanks and move them into battle. Nikolai Beryshev and a group of tankers went out in search of them. On the first day the group found nothing, but on the second day, luck showed up. Ahead, between the trees stood two medium-sized German tanks. But what kind of tanks were they? One was completely shattered by a direct hit from a heavy gun shell, the broken engine was lying about 15 meters from the tank, the gearbox was sticking out of the snow in the other direction, and the armor was torn. Small parts were scattered in a radius of 50 meters. Here too, among the metal wreckage, in the snow lay the corpses of German tankers. There was nothing to do here except to note what parts might be useful in repairing other tanks that had not yet been found. The second tank stood not far from the remains of the first. It was not suitable for repair. Half of the turret was lying on the ground, smashed by an anti-tank cannon shell. None of the Soviet tank crews knew how German tanks worked, so they all studied the unfamiliar system. They fiddled with the two tanks until late. They took apart battered units and compared them with the survivors of the second tank. At dawn on the third day they decided to continue their search. But the forest was still empty, except for the bodies of German soldiers scattered everywhere and the usual traces of the battle that had taken place here a few days before. How long have we been fighting in this perilous swamp? Berishev thought. Either we move them, or they move us. How many of our guys are dead here, and it's no use, we're trampling in place. If only we had three dozens of tanks in good working order. The group halted as they moved forward through the snow-covered forest. A greenish-gray turret of a German tank could barely be seen between the pines in the front, not far from where the forward German trenches were. This German tank had crossed the Soviet defensive line, managed to enter the forest, but immediately ended its fight crawled further. Noticing the men crawling up to the tank, the Germans fired a machine gun so that, buried in the snow, ours were forced to lie down. Then, choosing the seconds between the bursts, listening to the vigorous rifle automatic exchange of fire from both sides, all five of them crawled from snowdrift to snowdrift and from pine to pine, got close to the tank and lay down behind it. The tank had its starboard side facing us, and the side hatch was open. Inside the tank was chaos caused by grenades that had exploded there. The control levers had been broken off and the entire control system was disrupted. The German crewmen were lying beaten up outside the tank. Then the repairs began. They looked over everything, reassembled the torn rods, made sure there was antifreeze in the cooling system, not water, and so the radiator was intact. Looked at all the electrical stuff, fixed the torn wiring, tried all the valve starter, screwed the pump. It was important to start the tank and steal it out of the firing zone. We went to the infantrymen for fuel and they ran to the artillerymen and in an hour and a half brought several canisters. When they filled the tank, Barry Shev pushed the starter button and the engine started well. We could take the car out, but there was a minefield all around. In stripes of melted snow, here and there, anti-tank mines were visible. Other mines might not have been visible. Snow drifts and large pillows of moss were especially to be feared. Everyone looked at each other. Beryshev waved his hand and said, Come on! Then boldly and confidently, but very cautiously, Mechanic Belayev led the tank through the minefield, passing some mines between the caterpillars, others bypassing them by leaving them aside. The mines were not staggered, as they should be but scattered as they came. It made it possible to maneuver. The small, 
Anti-personnel mines under the caterpillars crackled like clappers such mines could not harm the tank. Having left the battlefield we unexpectedly met with the same trophy tank. It was driven by another team of tankers. They greeted each other and, meeting at the cars, drank a hundred grams before the march. Car by car, with big red flags over the open hatches, they went further together. After passing through the woods for five kilometers, we approached the area where our troops were stationed. These were medium-sized German T3 tanks with square black crosses painted on the armor on the sides against a white background. The Berishev tank, with a large number, 121, above the tracks, was a modernized tank armed with a 75mm cannon. Released by a German military factory in February 1942, this tank came into the possession of a Soviet tank battalion on March 28, 1942, to join the Soviet offensive a week later, after a thorough overhaul. On the same night Senior Sergeant Nikolai Ivanovich Beryshev was appointed commander of the tank he brought. The third company was formed in the battalion from all ten reconstructed captured tanks. Beryshev and the crew of his German tank were to fight in the German rear, but that's another story.